Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Long Goodbye, Understanding Anticipatory Grief Associated with Caregivers of Patients with Alzheimer's Disease and Other Dementias. My name is Lauren Blair, and I'm the Provider and Community Relations Manager at Coastal Hospice. Welcome to our Caregiver Academy. We are excited that you're joining us today. Among our attendees today, we are happy to see so many familiar organizations with us. I see colleagues from Title Health, Atlantic General Hospital, Wicomico Nursing Home, Anchorage, Line Industries and Services of Maryland, Deers Head, and so many more. We want to give an extra special thanks also to our caregivers who have joined us today. Thank you for all that you do to care for others in your life. Before we begin, allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. My role today is to help facilitate and handle the behind the scenes logistics of the webinar. You may see myself or my colleagues Alejandra and Joy pop up in the chat box to address or help with any technical issues. I wanna thank you for your patience ahead of time, should we have any. I'll also come back in at the end to discuss the program evaluation. We ask that you set aside other devices or work for the next hour. We are sure that you will enjoy our program today. To make this interactive, we encourage you to ask questions and add comments. We will be using the chat feature to communicate with you throughout the webinar. You can access it by clicking on the messaging icon in your meeting controls. When you send a message, please be sure to select everyone for the two box so we can all see your questions or comments. We will save questions and comments to the end of the presentation, but feel free to enter in the chat box at any time. There are currently estimated to be over 55 million people worldwide living with dementia. The number of people affected is set to rise to 139 million by 2050, leaving even more families to grieve the loss of their loved ones while they are still with us. I have the pleasure of hosting and moderating this webinar, and in the frame of Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, I have invited Alvin T. Harmon, our Bereavement Care Services and Compass Program Manager, to bring you his live keynote presentation, The Long Goodbye, Understanding Anticipatory Grief Associated with Alzheimer's Disease and Other Dementias. Alvin Harmon is a Salisbury native and the senior pastor of the Refreshing Well Discipleship Center in Delmar, Maryland. He is a pillar of his community and received his theological education with Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, where he holds a degree in biblical studies. Following, Alvin was educated by the College of Pastoral Supervision and Psychotherapy, interning with the University of Maryland and Anne Arundel Medical Center of Maryland, through which he received his clinical pastoral education. Simultaneously, he studied at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University with a focus on bioethics. Alvin is a trained end-of-life doula and a candidate for national certification by the National End-of-Life Doula Alliance. He enjoys spending time with his family, but often finds time to encourage, serve, and uplift others wherever it is arranging and organizing community service projects, speaking for various nonprofit and civic organizations, or shooting videos of any of his nine grandchildren. Outside of his service to others, he enjoys singing, visiting, and visiting the many serene waters of the Eastern Shore. When asked why he likes working at Coastal Hospice, his reply was simply, it allows me a rare but precious opportunity to support Coastal Hospice patients and families through what could be considered one of the most sacred and difficult times of their lives. In summation, Alvin is a man who is wholly devoted to meeting the needs of others. He considers himself blessed to have an occupation that allows him to do what he loves the most, care for others. Alvin, thank you so much for being here today. We're delighted to have you with us. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that great introduction. And good afternoon to all the attendees here today. Your willingness to share your time is greatly appreciated. I am very honored for this opportunity to empower caregivers with the tools to help identify and manage their grief. My hope is that the ideas that are shared here today will help educate and motivate meaningful support for those who do not always know how to ask for it, the caregivers of Alzheimer's disease patients. I began my career with Coastal Hospice as a coordinator for our non-medical pre-hospice program named Compass. It was within that role that I had my first 
and most meaningful encounters with those affected by Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. The COMPASS program, although a part of Coastal Hospice, was simply a response to the daily needs and struggles of the clients and their families who suffer from serious illnesses within the communities we serve. COMPASS gave me an opportunity to build genuine relationships with families in the home. This safe environment gave place to real conversations. Conversations about the genuine concerns that family members have and the caregivers of their Alzheimer's disease loved ones. My only agenda was to spend a solid hour or so once a month, more if requested, to inquire if any additional resource management was needed and maybe from time to time, provide a smile or some form of little support to the caregiver. However, what grew from these encounters were very transparent conversations about the thoughts, moods, and the struggles of the AD caregivers. What gave validity to these conversations was that I had a front row seat to the noticeable decline in their Alzheimer's disease loved one, many whom I supported for several years. I understood that these families were my clients but I was authentically engaged in their efforts. To me, they became much, much more. As an integral part of the Coastal Hospice Compass Program, I believe that my somewhat unique perspective of the AD patient and those who care for them has developed in me a richer understanding of their struggles and experiences, perhaps none greater than those surrounding grief and loss. So let's begin this presentation by simply identifying the type of grief associated with the caregivers of Alzheimer's disease patients. Anticipatory grief is grief that occurs before death. It is common among people facing the eventual death of a loved one or even their own death. Most people expect to feel grief after the death, but fewer are familiar with grief that shows up before a life ends. One of the most critical, but often unnoticed aspects of the caregiver experience is grief. Anticipatory grief in dementia caregiving is real grief. And it is equivalent in intensity to death-related grief. Grief is a universal human experience. We all suffer losses and feel the anguish that follows. While it may be true that grief finds its full definition in response to death, significant grief reactions emerge in response to other losses as well. For example, bearing witness to the gradual death of a loved one's memory and personal identity from Alzheimer's disease brings a unique form of grief associated with present and anticipated losses prior to bodily death. For all too many caregivers, the burden of this grief is carried alone without meaningful recognition or support. I cannot tell you the countless times that caregivers have said to me, this is not the person I married, or the devastation communicated to me by the adult son or daughter caregiver whose parent that once adored them no longer recognizes them or even remembers that they have children at all. This type of loss and grief is widely undetected, not only by those close friends and family members, but also the caregivers themselves. We normally associate these feelings with the disease itself by accepting them as a response to Alzheimer's disease symptoms. What we often fail to acknowledge is that many caregivers will not simply say, it hurts me so much that mom doesn't remember me. What can cause an even deeper emotional challenge is when other siblings are remembered by their loved one. It is very important that when we encounter these caregivers to not only listen to what is being said, but to also have some awareness for what is not being said. So grief for the Alzheimer's disease caregiver can largely be focused on the loss of the caregiver's life as opposed to the life of the care receiver themselves. I wanna say that one more time. Grief for the AD caregiver can largely be focused 
on the loss of the caregiver's life as opposed to the life of the care receiver themselves. What we're talking about here are the genuine sacrifices that are made of the caregivers to support their loved ones who suffer from Alzheimer's disease. This can look like losing time from work or losing employment altogether, losing time from other loved ones, losing personal time, loss of personal freedom, losing time to sleep, loss of your normal routine, losing finances to purchase things like supplies, physical supplies, structural aids, losing finances to pay for private caregivers, losing finances to pay for respite services. Even sometimes we can lose possessions. The consideration to let go of jewelry or cars or recreational vehicles or homes, and sometimes even retirement packages can be devastating. The consideration or act of depleting finances set aside for retirement is different from dipping in the rainy day savings. Losing retirement finances can mean an entire lifestyle change. I once supported a family member some time ago who had made some very good financial decisions in their lives. And these decisions afforded them an opportunity to retire in their late 40s. Their 4,000 square foot home was paid for. They had every recreational toy you could think of. Their only plan was to wait for their children to graduate college and get their careers going before this couple will begin a life of travel and leisure. Unexpectedly, before that could happen, the wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and suddenly new plans had to be made. As her disease progressed, the need for support increased. Her spouse now had to consider and implement choices that would not only alter his present, but also change his future. It was very difficult for me to view the symptoms of his pain. It was all I could do to console him as in time, every one of our conversations ended in tears. I supported him through the years as each new decision to sacrifice what should have been their future became harder than the last. It was not as simple as just doing what needed to be done to support her and her illness because he loved her. Because these were not just things to him. These were the realized dreams that they had built and amassed together. Every inch of that home had his wife tied to it. Every dime they had in the bank had their hope for the future entwined. Finally, this husband made the decision to return to the workforce because at that time he was at risk of losing it all. Now what he had to lose may be very different in scope to others, but not in value. Grieving in real time for any caregiver of an Alzheimer's disease loved one can look a lot like this. Saying goodbye can be very painful, especially long drawn out ones, such as those involving Alzheimer's disease. Anticipatory grief for the individual in this state is inescapable due to the slow, incurable, and progressive nature of the disease. Researchers at the University of Indianapolis polled 400 ca caregivers, asking them all the same question. What is the biggest barrier you face as a caregiver? More than 80% said it was the loss of the person they used to know. Anticipatory grief can hurt just as much as when your loved one dies. Sometimes it makes the ultimate loss after death a bit easier, but this isn't always the case. Allow yourself to feel the grief, process it, and try to appreciate the time you have left with your loved one. Most caregivers of Alzheimer's disease patients are grieving several losses, not just one. These are just a few of the losses you face when someone close to you is near death. You may be fear, fearing that you are losing your lifetime companion. I'm talking about the person who does life with you, is a part of all of your victories and all of your setbacks. What can be most incomprehensible is that this loss happens internally. 
The eyes are still so beautiful. The face is as lovely as it ever was. But the loss of memory can feel as if the individual themselves have gone completely missing. You may feel that the roles in your family are changing. Accepting the role of the primary caregiver itself can communicate the loss of identity for the caregiver themselves. You are no longer the one who is being cared for. You are now the care provider. You may feel that you're losing your security. Often, the Alzheimer's disease sufferer had a primary role in which their companion has no idea how to perform. Things like bill paying, home maintenance. There can be some thoughts that everything might just fall apart. You may be losing your dreams about the future, losing your hope about the future. As previously noted, the now unknown future can completely dash all dreams as plans. Not to mention the strain that it can place on the families of the adult child caregiver. Talking about the in-laws, they have a new role to take. Now you put strain on the person that you love, your husband or wife as a child, as a child caregiver. Grief before death often involves more anger. If you're unable to express your feelings in a way which feels safe, feelings of anger may increase. Sometimes, if you express anger towards people who don't understand, it might seem to them that you're pushing them away. This in turn can lead to increased feelings of anger and isolation. More loss of emotional control could lead to outbursts, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, suicidal thoughts, self-harm, and other self-damaging behaviors. Grief before death may also involve atypical grief responses. These can be normal grief, but somehow they become delayed, inhibited, or prolonged. Or symptoms which are not part of normal grieving may develop and complicate it, sometimes partly replacing or obscuring the grief altogether. These unexpected emotions may be because you're in an in-between place when a loved one is dying and trying to hope to hold on. You might feel mixed up as you try to find the balance between those two places, the balance between hope and letting go. Some feel grieving in advance might be seen as giving up. So discussions surrounding that topic are avoided. Avoiding discussions around the emotional distress of the AD caregiver can add conflict to the grief experience. Primarily, for those who are at the end of life, anticipatory grief provides an opportunity for personal growth. It can be a way to find meaning and closure. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, however, cognitive decline makes it difficult, if not impossible, for patients and caregivers to grieve together. Normally for both, the chance to say goodbye can feel like a gift. However, with caregivers of Alzheimer's disease, it is often the gift never given. I think back to a client I supported who was taking care of her grandson and brother. As she would share with me how she wanted to be remembered, share with me the things that she wanted to be remembered for. She would sometimes bring her voice down to a whisper. She shared with me later that it was because her grandson never wanted to hear her talk about dying from her disease. During a different visit with this same client, her grandson overheard us having a conversation about her pending death. And he became very upset and screamed at her, stop talking like that. And what her grandson did not understand was that avoiding the conversation for this patient was complicating her grief and subsequently complicating his own. I'll never forget one of the last conversations I had with this patient, which included her statement, his ability to talk with me is stressing me out. I asked her to elaborate and she said, I'm forced to tell a stranger what my wishes are instead of my own flesh and blood. And please, if you have any questions or comment, please type them in the chat and we'll promise to answer them to you later.
The reactions of anticipatory grief are quite comparable to those which appear after a loss. Some days you may not feel any sorrow at all, while other days may prove to be very, very difficult. If we fail to properly recognize and address anticipatory grief, social withdrawal and emotional numbness can take place. Indicators of this type of grief can include having trouble carrying out normal routines, isolation from others. Maybe you decide to just withdraw from social activities altogether. You could be experiencing depression, deep sadness, or guilt. Some believe that they could have done something, anything that might have prevented the disease from happening altogether. Feelings that life isn't worth living without your loved one may incur. There can be this self-constructed demand to contain emotions in an unsafe manner and present that containment as strength. To hear the sentiment, you're so strong from friends and family who know your work as a caregiver can be intended to communicate praise and support. However, this can be a misrepresentation of the caregiver's reluctance to express their feelings of grief rather than a display of strength. Here are some grief feelings that are most commonly understood. Physical problems. Grief can cause physical problems such as trouble sleeping, memory loss issues. It can cause fear, anxiety, intense concern for the person dying. You may feel some loneliness. Caregivers of someone dying from Alzheimer's disease may constantly feel lonely or isolated. If you're concerned about expressing grief before death, it could also add to your feelings of isolation. However, in the case of AD caregivers, common grief symptoms can gradually fade over time, linger, or get worse. This type of grief is like being in an ongoing heightened state of mourning that prevents you from healing. Some of those signs and symptoms may include intense sorrow, intense pain, rumination of your loved one that just doesn't stop, focusing on little else but what you're expecting to happen. Other thoughts are extreme focus on reminders of the loved one or excessive avoidance of those reminders, some numbness or possibly detachment altogether. You could feel some bitterness about the pending loss, feeling that life holds no meaning or purpose. You may also feel the lack of trust in others or the inability to enjoy life or interpret positive experiences with the care receiver. Some of the less commonly known or understood addressed symptoms of grief are irritability and anger. You may feel anger to have to cope with the dying loved one's anger meaning you might be upset that you have to deal with what they're dealing with. You have to deal with their emotions. You may be angry about the loss of sexual intimacy. You may have some jealousy of others who don't have to be caregivers. And you ask yourself this question, is it right to feel this way? You may have an increased desire to talk. Loneliness can also fuel a need to talk to someone, anyone who might understand how you feel and is willing to listen without judgment. If you don't have a safe place to express your grief, these emotions can lead to social withdrawal and emotional numbness. You also may be feeling guilty. The suffering of a loved one can bring feelings of guilt. You long for your loved one to be free of pain, even though that might mean death. You may also feel some survivor's guilt because you will continue to go on with your life while they will not. These thoughts all are normal, even if you feel guilty about them. So let's ask this question, how do we cope? First, we must understand that anticipatory grief is normal. You are allowed to mourn before death, so don't feel badly about it. Take care of yourself. Caregiving demands energy 
that you must replenish, replenish. Stopping to rest is a necessity, not a luxury. Also, seek professional help. Coastal Hospice, the Alzheimer's Association, we offer a variety of support services for families dealing with dementia. You might qualify for some aids if you're on hospice to assist with your loved one's personal care, such as bathing, dressing, grooming, light housework. Social workers from Coastal Hospice can connect you with community resources and if necessary, personal counseling services. One of the last things you have to understand is that you have to take a break. You have to take a break. If you qualify for respite through Coastal Hospice, your loved one will be cared for by trained individuals while you take time for a mini vacation, to take a nap, to go shopping, to attend a caregiver support group, or do any other self-care activity. As a caregiver who is always willing to help when needed, you may have a hard time reaching out for help for you. However, it's important to know when to pick up the phone, call a friend, or join a support group. There are many other people going through the same thing you are. And here are some steps you can take to ease the anticipatory grief that you might be feeling. Ask friends or family for help around the house, as well as emotional support. Remember that it's okay to cry or admit that you're angry or frustrated. These are helpful ways to keep pent up emotions from turning into resentment toward the person you're caring for or from taking a toll on your own personal health. The Coastal Hospice Caregiver Support Group offers education, guidance, emotional, and safe non-judgmental space. You can attend while caring for someone with any stage of dementia. Some group guests are at the beginning of their journey while others have been at it for a while. In a support group, you'll find other dementia caregivers who understand the basic outline of your daily challenges. Finding people who just get it is a really big deal. Another thing you can do is build a care team. This is one of my favorites. A care team is the group of people who you'll partner with to provide you help, care, support, and connection throughout the course of the disease. Each person is responsible for one task in the caregiving group. You're in the center, but you're not there alone. This help can minimize stress and feelings of being overwhelmed. Developing your own network of helpers may help you lead a more productive, active, and engaged life. So one thing you really need to try to do is to stay in the present. Try to live for the moment without focusing so much on the future. How can this be done? Notice the ways that your loved one is still present. If you're finding it difficult to connect with the present because you're overwhelmed by what the future might hold, challenge yourself to identify five to 10 ways that your loved one is still present. You may notice them in certain objects you have around the house. You may notice them in your family traditions. Notice them in your children's laughter, your shared values, the way you continue to talk to them and so on. Focus on one thing at a time. Many people don't realize that multitasking is a myth. What you're really doing is switching your focus back and forth between tasks, stopping, and then starting over again each time. Not only are time and efficiency lost in this transition, but we must ask ourselves, are we ever able to be fully present with either task? And if you're anything like me, the whole time you're doing one task, you're thinking about and planning for the next. Now, layer grief brain on top of that, and you've got a gigantic mess. Think about it. On any random day, grief wreaks havoc on things like memory and concentration. Allow yourself to lose track of time and get lost in the moment. This can be very difficult for grieving people for several reasons. First, 
Many people have shared that the second they notice themselves becoming lost in a moment, they feel guilty for not thinking about their loved one. Remember, it's okay to take a break from your grief. It's okay to feel things like joy and happiness. Experiencing positive emotions doesn't mean that you're not also grieving. Please, and if you have any questions, comments, please throw them into the chat. So another way of coping with anticipatory grief for the Alzheimer's disease patient and the caregiver is to begin journaling. And I know journaling sounds sappy to a lot of people, but here's what you need to know. Whether it's with a support group, a counselor, a good friend, within the privacy of a journal, sharing what you're going through can ease those moments when you're sad, powerless, and tired. Journaling is simply the practice of keeping a diary or journal that explores thoughts and feelings surrounding the events of your life. Journaling works best when done consistently, but even occasional sporadic journaling can be beneficial when focused on gratitude or emotional processing. Journaling allows people to clarify their thoughts and feelings, thereby gaining valuable self-knowledge. It's also a good problem-solving tool. Often, one can hash out a problem and produce solutions more easily on paper. Journaling helps one process their grief by fully exploring and releasing the emotions involved. 20% of Alzheimer's disease caregivers experience complicated grief due to unaddressed emotional pain. Keep a journal and write down your feelings every day. Give yourself permission to grieve. Many caregivers don't get the help they need or they try to do more than they are able physically or financially. Often caregivers place unreasonable burdens upon themselves in part because they see providing care as their exclusive responsibility. Some family members, such as siblings, adult children, or the patient him or herself may place unreasonable demands on the caregiver. So what you need to do is set realistic goals. Accept that you may need help with caregiving and turn to others for help with some of your most basic tasks. Be realistic about your loved one's disease. Acknowledge to yourself that there may come a time when your loved one requires more than you can provide. Know your limits and be honest with yourself about your personal situation. Recognize and accept your actual capacity as a caregiver. At the very least, call Coastal Hospice and get some support and guidance. They might be able to help you process all of that information. Anticipatory grief is normal. But in some cases, this grief can be so intense that it interferes with your ability to cope. It's also common for people to develop depression amid overwhelming loss. It can be hard to tell grief and depression apart. Seek help with a mental health professional if you're having a hard time coping. A therapist can help you decide if you're coping with normal grief or complicated grief. We must first recognize that the painful awareness of a coming death can help the Alzheimer's disease caregivers find ways to say goodbye while there's still time. It's important to let yourself grieve. Find a professional, a friend, or another loved one that might be able to help you share your feelings openly. They may be able to help you to maintain hope. They also may be able to help you prepare for the death in total. Some people may wonder why you're grieving before the death has happened, and some may even be angry about it. Keep in mind that letting go doesn't mean that you have to stop loving the person you're losing. Give yourself permission to grieve. Doing what you can to ease the emotional pain of caring for your loved one with Alzheimer's disease is a really smart step. AD caregivers need to know that feelings of grief and loss are absolutely normal and that other caregivers face the same emotional difficulties. Everyone grieves differently, 
and there are no hard or fast rules. Know your limits, use your coping techniques, and call for help when you need it. Thank you for joining us today, and please take a couple of minutes to answer our survey. And if you need to contact us, look here. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Alvin. This was an amazing presentation. So much information that I know many people can relate to. So thank you. I have a couple of great questions that have come in through the chat box during the presentation. And I encourage everyone to keep, uh, keep asking questions and we'll be happy to, uh, to answer those for you. So my first question that I have in the chat box is what about the anger or anxiety that one has as a caregiver? How can I take care of that? Should I reach out to my doctor? How do I know if it's more than grief, like depression? Yeah, absolutely. So first, just being able to identify that, you know, I'm a little angrier than usual, or maybe the anger that I'm feeling is being displaced, being able to, to recognize it, um, being able to identify it. Yeah, absolutely. You can reach out to your, your physician, um, you know, and also Coastal Hospice is wonderful about just being able to take questions and, and, and suggesting resources for people. So anything like that will put you, make, be good first steps. Wonderful, wonderful. So identifying how we're feeling and reaching out for help, Coastal Hospice is a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Great. My next question in the chat box is, can you give examples of things a care team might be able to help me with on my, something that they can help me with? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, a care team, you can have one person that is just responsible for doing maybe the laundry for, for the week. And then having that team rotate sometimes is good, but being able to turn your focus as a caregiver on the patient themselves and having someone else to just say, you know, I'm going to come over today and I'm going to do your laundry. The couple hours it takes, I'm going to do that once a week. Or having someone saying, hey, I'm going to be your, your grocery store runner, you know, this week. Just having one person on your team that is willing to take some task that is, you can, so you can redirect your, your effort and not get, suffer burnout um, while dealing with your loved one. That's great advice, Alvin. That's a great idea because uh, so many times people ask you, you know, can I do something to help? And you don't really always know or think of things to be able to tell them to do for you. So something simple like run into the grocery store or running an errand or doing the laundry, such simple tasks, but yet could mean so much to someone who's caregiving. And that's just one more huge thing on their checklist. Yeah. And Lauren, you make a really good point. So one thing that was when people are asking us, say yes. You know, a lot of times going back to some of the things from the side is that we carry so much and we adopt so much. For some reason, we, you know, our, our decision is to assume all of the responsibility. Um, and, you know, one thing that I've, I've constantly done when I talk with um, our patients and when I speak to their caregivers, I look at them and I say, how are you? After I finish talking with the patient and I look at the caregivers and so many times I can't tell you how they just burst into tears just from that question. They've never said anything. And that load is so heavy. Um, you know, so being able to say, yes, I need help, you know, and, you know, if you could just do this, having, you know, maybe four to five people take care, be responsible for one act can take such a load off of the caregiver, the primary caregiver. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes a huge difference. My next question from Donna Lynch is, how do you deal with being a caregiver for a loved one, but there is another sibling that doesn't help? It can be depressing and angry. Oh, Donna, I can't tell you how many times I've run into that. Um, you know, one thing I, I found um, very encouraging is to allow family members to at least verbalize. Sometimes they have to write it out in a letter and say, you know, this is difficult for me and saying that to a sibling, saying this is difficult for me. And I would really appreciate if you, you know, you would help me in this area, give them a task um, in this area. And if not that area, you know, maybe, you know, allow them to give you a, a place where they can, they can help or they can assign. And if, if they're not willing to, then you know you could reach out to to coastal hospice and they can try, try to connect you to different resources in the community maybe to help support i've you know so many resources that people don't know about 
Um, and that was kind of the design of Compass is to try to connect people to these resources to help support um, these family members, especially the caregivers. I love that idea. I mean, I love the idea of writing a letter because I know so many times you, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get things out. We want to take care of our loved ones, of course, and we want to do everything we can, but as it gets more and more and it builds up and you get more and more frustrated. I know myself, it's, you know, that's how, that's just natural of how you feel. And so I think writing a letter is good because it's an opportunity to express how you feel, but also being able to, um, to get it all out in an environment that is safe and not just waiting till we, till we blow off or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just being able to say, you know, this, I'm angry and this is the reason why, you know, that begins the therapy process, that begins the supportive process. Absolutely. Absolutely. My next question is from Maggie Miller. Maggie asks, any suggestions on dealing with guilt if the patient needs a nursing home instead of staying at home? Yeah, sure, Maggie. So, you know, making that decision is hard for a lot of family members. Um, and it goes back to the comment I made about, you know, just being able to know what your limitations are. You know, if, if, it, if it's gone beyond the scope of your ability, you're actually doing better by the patient by allowing, you know, someone else to kind of come in and help support. Um, as far as the guilt process, just finding, you know, a support group would be amazing because a lot of those same people having those same issues, um, you know, are, are there and they can help walk someone through that process, you know, and it's not going to make maybe the guilt just disappear, but it can help you process it a little better. That's great. So support groups. So the coastal hospice support groups, are they also dealing with anticipatory grief too? Yeah. So our, our, our grief support groups cover all types of topics, um, pet loss, but anticipatory grief is one of the ones. So just, you know, be on the lookout, you know, for that group when it pops up, pops up, we're doing six weeks. So if you're constantly checking the coastal hospice calendar website, you know, that information will be, will be available at some point. That's wonderful. Thank you. My next question is, at what point in the journey do you recommend that caregivers obtain support? Yes, yeah, so I would say for a caregiver, at the, at the moment that you realize that, you know, that, that weight is becoming heavy, I would say reach out. Um, we, you know, with our caregiver support groups and dementia groups, we have people that, you know, just got started caregiving and they just want the information to know, you know, what should I expect, you know, and they hear that from people who have, you know, been it for some time, some that are kind of midway. So the sooner you get the information, I believe, um, the better you'll be able to begin to process what you're going to deal with going through. That's a great piece of information. In my previous life, I was the director of a memory care program at a nursing home, and I would get patients involved in hospice very early, not just for the patient, but for the families, really, because it was such great support that myself and my staff just was not equipped to provide, and we couldn't do that um, at the nursing home. It was just, you know, too many patients, so having coastal hospice able to come and either talk to the families on the phone or come in person or whatever the case may be and just offer that support was just such an important, important thing for, for my patients with memory loss and, and dementia. Yeah, I can, uh, Lauren, the, the, the example that I used in the beginning about the, the young couple, I remember speaking to him later and, you know, he would just say, you know, Alvin, there's, there's no book on this. You know, I, there's, there's no one has written this down how to deal with this, but, you know, kind of having um, conversations with people who have walked this walk and are involved in it and knows the ins and outs and have experienced the same struggles, you know, it can be a, a big support, a big help and the sooner, the better. Great information. Great. My next question that I have is, I feel like I have already lost my mom. How can I maintain a relationship with her? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, with this particular disease and, and many people, you just have to kind of be where she is, you know, um, appreciate what you see her in, in, in the moment. And there may be moments when, you know, she calls you someone else or she may be experiencing you know, a different time in her life, maybe sometime in the past, go with her, you know, go with her and, and enjoy that moment that you have, you know, um, eventually, you know, 
uh, you you can use these things to help build, you know, your fondest memories. You know, oh, I remember when mom and I, you know, took this trip to 1924 and she was telling me X, Y, Z. Um, it, it really can be some beautiful moments uh, created out of out of uh, those those situations. That's great. So really just being in the moment with your mom and um, being on her on her wavelength, not our own and not trying to reorient to to what time, what place we're at, but really just living through what she's doing right now is is creating some new memories for you. Oh, yeah, I, I had I had a, a, a son and a mother and son and he would actually you know if, if he felt like it was uh she was in a certain time he would try to match his lingo with the time frame and you know or or put on music from that era or something like that to really engage her uh where she was and i, I thought it was a beautiful thing that's amazing yeah that's really that's really beautiful very special very good idea from him our next question we have is my family doesn't understand that I'm grieving, even though my husband is still alive. They say that I cry because I need the attention. How can I make them understand what I'm going through? Yeah, so the, the hard truth in that is, you know, some people may never understand what you're going through, especially when it concerns anticipatory grief. Uh, some people become angry that you choose to grieve prior to a death. Um, but it's infor important for uh, you as a caregiver to recognize that. And you may have to go outside of that circle in order to, su to find support. You know, uh, communicate your truth, communicate your reality. And, and but you may have to go somewhere else. And again, I say the Coastal Hospice Caregiver Support Group is a fantastic resource uh, to help find people that are, you know, have walked that walk, who understand finding people who get it is so important. You know, you, you will find your people in that caregiver support group. So even if we may not necessarily be able to turn the minds of those around us, there's other support out there that we can that we can receive and be able to um, to relate to others. Yeah, sure. I mean, you you could you know you risk increasing your frustration and adding to uh, you know some negative uh, uh, air and you know with your uh, your personal health. Um, and you want to avoid that at all possible costs. So, you know, communicate. And if they don't receive it, if they don't respond in the way you want them to, you just have to accept that. But know that there are people out here who actually get it and are willing to support you in that in that realm. Great, great. Wonderful, wonderful information. The next question we have from the audience is how can I deal with the anticipatory grief that my children are feeling for me as they watch me in this journey with my disease? Yeah, so I mean that that's a great question. You know, one thing is to, you know, as best as possible, you know, try to connect them to, to resources, you know, talk about it. Um, be honest about it. Let them know, you know, there I need you to 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 get support. You know, I need you to to try to, you know, get some space from your for yourself. One of the main things that, you know. Uh, I tell uh, caregivers everywhere I go is take time for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, make time for yourself. And it's not always, you know, people will say, and you have to, you have to be deliberate about it. You know, there's always going to be more work. There's always going to be more tasks, always going to be more chores. You have to carve out some space in your life so that you can have that. And I, I promise you, it will be fulfilling. It's important. It's a necessity to get that rest. So having self-care and being able to take some time for yourself, as well as having the children reach out for support where they need it. So it's not just all the burden put on the actual person who's who's going through. Yeah. And it, that I found that to be, you know, just in my own experience, I found that to be very difficult for a lot of uh, adult children of, of, uh, of patients that are caregivers um, because, you know, they have felt this responsibility that mom or dad has taken care of me all my life and now it's my turn um, and there's nothing wrong with trying to you know assume that responsibility to care for again I go back to saying just know your limitations and make sure that you take time for yourself you know the the, the more relaxed you are uh, the more uh, tasks that you have kind of disseminated the more support you have 
um, the better off you will be, the, the more healthy you will be as an individual, um, as a caregiver. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. And what feelings could we expect to have as the loss grows greater, as our person, our person we're caring for declines? Yeah, so, you know, again, I go back to, you know, one of the primaries is anger, um, just being angry altogether that this disease has found uh, your loved one. Um, also, and again, going back to one of the chat questions, realizing that, you know, not everybody really will, will help in, will chime in, will jump in, you know, the way that you want them to um, is a big deal and people become very frustrated. Also, um, trying to navigate um, the different resources that are available. That's a big, big help um, that people desire. Compass helps so much with that. Coastal Hospice helps so much with that, just navigating those pieces uh, for family members. One of the things that I, that I tell families uh, when, when it concerns Compass is that, you know, we, we take a lot of that figuring out for you. That's the way I communicate it to them because, you know, they're, they're beating their head against the wall trying to figure out what to do. And Compass has their hand, you know, Coastal Hospice, same resources, just already attached to so many different resources um, to help these patients and families out. So, yeah, that's, that's a big help. Getting connected to those resources early on. Absolutely, absolutely. We've got about time for maybe one more question. So I'm gonna ask this one. Do you have any suggestions on how to find the joy you once had in your life while caring for uh, and after losing your loved one? So the joy that you once had in your life before and after. Yeah, and, and this is, this is gonna be maybe kind of a hard answer for some people. And it goes back to just being, just being able to actually disconnect. Like it is okay you know, for some reason, people have come to feel that, you know, if I'm not grieving, if I'm not um, all focused on my uh, my Alzheimer's patient, then somehow that makes me a bad person. And it's OK. You know, that's that is going to be there. The grief is going to be there. And this grief is not a bad word. This is it a normal response, you know, to the losses that we suffer? Um, the grief is going to be there. But what you need to give yourself permission to do is to actually pull away. If something is funny and you feel like laughing, laugh. You know, if, if someone says something that makes you smile or, you know, someone that you enjoy spending company with makes you smile, then go and enjoy that smile. Enjoy that moment. It's, it's fine. I promise you. Um, and, you know, and, and, and be intentional about that. Be intentional about it. That's really great. Um, great advice. Just being able to disconnect because it is hard when I feel like when you're more going through these tough challenges in life to be able to say, I'm not going to be all consumed by it, or I'm going to let myself smile. I'm going to let myself enjoy an afternoon when I have a break. It's hard to do that when you are focused on caregiving for someone. So knowing that it's okay to do that, and it's actually good for us to do that is, is a big help. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I have to say again, you know, it, it doesn't take away from, you know, from your love, your care. You still care. You still, but it's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Alvin. We're close to being out of time for today, but in summary, Alvin, I just want to ask you if there's one thing that we take away from this presentation today, what should it be? And again, I say, just know that this is all normal. You don't have to feel guilty. Um, you know, even if you do, it's normal. It's normal. Grief is normal. Anticipatory grief is normal. It is legitimate. Um, it is fair for you to feel that way. Um, and take time for yourself. Get your emotions out. Write your feelings down. Express, you know, your anger. Verbalize what you're dealing with and reach out to resources. Reach out to resources. I can't say it enough. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you so much for this presentation on this topic. I know that is relevant to so many of us. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We hope the information was useful to you. To wrap things up, we ask you to take a couple of minutes to fill out the short survey. It's only five simple questions. Your feedback will help us bring relevant programs to you, your practice, and those you care for. 
When you click leave the meeting, you will receive a survey from Zoom. We will send you a link in the survey in our follow-up email to you as well. This was a presentation from the Coastal Caregiver Academy, supporting and empowering caregivers in our community. At Coastal Hospice, we are here for you and you can call us at any time at the number on the screen. Thank you once again for joining us. I am Lauren Blair. Have a wonderful rest of your day.